welcome to WLT Book Buzz. I'm Boomy. And I'm Lauda, and we're both former interns of WLT and self-professed book lovers. We currently work in children's book publishing and just love books so much, but we also love travel. And so when we're not reading, we're oftentimes exploring different parts of the world. And this show brings those two loves together as we try to exemplify and uplift diverse voices in literature. Yeah, so as you are well aware, or maybe if you're new here and you're like, how did I get here? We highlight and record different episodes about different um, backgrounds and cultures and diverse ranges of children's books across, you know, genres and categories. And we're always on the lookout for new books by BIPOC authors and illustrators. And we're always reading books across these different categories and sharing them mostly with each other, but with also honestly anyone else who will listen to us ramble. Um, but this month's theme is da 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 da. Booey, take it away. Indigenous voices. Yay! <laughs> so this month we decided that we want to focus in on voices of indigenous writers, um, our First Nation writers, um, mostly in the U.S. Um, since that's where we live. And so if you're in a different part of the world, we would love to hear indigenous writers from your part of the world. If that's something that you want to drop in the comments. Um, and so we just really want to highlight those voices. One thing that we have noticed recently, and recently I would say within the last like five. Five, 10 years maybe is just how there we've been creating more space for indigenous writers and obviously all diverse voices but especially indigenous writers um Lada and I were recently re reminiscing about how as kids like the very first book of Native American uh that I read was um Tommy DePaulo's uh The Legend of the Blue Bonnet just because I'm a Texan so you know that's what we got to read and uh he also has another one um I also love Cinderella stories so I've read The Rough Face Girl and those books are lovely but they're also not written by someone who's actually uh, native or from any of those uh, native tribes. And so I'm just really excited that we're able to bring to the table voices um, where people are writing from their own personal lived experience, their own ancestral experiences. Just so I think that type of storytelling is 10 times more powerful um, when it's coming from that authentic place and from that individual place. And it doesn't mean the other stories don't matter, but at the end of the day, like if we're going to uplift one voice over the other, I want to always uh, make sure that we are giving a platform to people who um, are writing from their own cultural context as much as possible. Yeah, Boomi said it very well. So I'm not even gonna try <laughs> like bounce off of that. I'm just gonna go straight into our different themes. We've kind of categorized our books that we've read by like um, more of like an overall category or a theme um, instead of doing it by our usual like age category or like format. Um, so our first theme is connection to earth slash nature. And I think we would all be remiss if we did not say automatically off the top of our heads, we are the water protectors, which as if you, if you are not aware, it won the Caldecott and it is a gloriously beautiful book. I read it, probably almost cried. The illustrations are phenomenal. And it's basically talking about like how you know, connected to the land and nature folks should be. And also like kind of looking at like how we can be better protectors of the earth. Um, of course, flat out went out and bought a copy. Um, but if you have not read it, what are you doing? Stop listening to us and go buy it. Yes, go rush, run to your, you know, nearest bookstore or either online or in person to get a copy. Like the art honestly could be framed just over and over again you just take pieces of that yeah, it. but you know the even the writing is just poetically written and it's one of those things where it allows a lot of conversation with you and mm -hmm. um, a child or even just with yourself about like what does it mean to be a protector and i mean she's definitely focusing on water here but it really like as a lot of pointed out like i look at like it, it really is about nature as a whole um and i just think that that's what i love about um native peoples in general is just like being able to learn how to like really think about the earth as um, uh, one of our part of our family, in a sense, and being willing to really honestly honor the land and make sure we take care of the land. And so um, I read two books that I think also do the same thing, um, where they um, one is called Sweetest Kulu, and the other one is We All Play, which also um, includes some Cree words. And so the Cree word or phrase for We All Play was Kimitanawa. Um, and basically like they basically take animals and compare them to children and to us and playing and how like mm -hmm. you know in both cases like these little lyrical poems and this fun playfulness that shows how like you know even when you as people we are just like the animals in some way and we share certain um similarities with them 
or even like there are certain gifts that are given to us by the animals and how do we honor that and so in both cases they really just honor um, nature and how like we are interconnected with that nature and they're just the cutest i mean like i feel like sweetest kulu you should give it to everybody for a baby shower gift um like it's just so adorable but yeah um, and so then our next theme was historical or history. I think a lot of times when we think about Native American stories and First Nation stories, Indigenous stories, we always go historical. And there's plenty there. So it's not like it's invalid to do so. Um, and so there's a few um, that exist. One of the ones that I thought about was um, Hiawatha and the Peacemaker. Um, and that's about um, a Native person named Hiawatha. And because and kind of how there's a lot of um, conflict between some of the native uh, tribes, even way before any sort of colonization, like just this is like set ages and ages ago, and how a peacemaker showed up and kind of like brought them all together to be one nation um, and to act more in partnership. And there also is a middle grade novel that kind of talks about the same thing called Peacemaker uh, by Joseph Bucock. And so um, those two, I just thought about the history because um, there is evidence that shows that these people were real and these stories were real and uh, but and, but they're also told with that native um like uh storytelling style in both yeah. cases that I thought was really beautiful and enjoyable um I would be remiss if I don't mention the birch bark house by Louis Eldridge she is a native writer who writes for both adults and kids actually and uh this is a chapter book slash middle grade and it's the first in five, a series of five I personally call it the Native American response to the little um house on the prairie books um, in the sense that it's kind of set around that same time of as all the white people are being pioneers and, you know, taking over more and more of the land, what's happening to the Native people, how are they responding in the same time period, and so um, those are great. And then the only other one I want to mention is um, I am not a number, you know, if we've been watching the news recently, we know that there's been a lot of conversations around uh, the boarding schools and uh, just a lot of the um, trauma and horror and not great things that were happening there. And this is a picture book that actually introduces um, what was happening in some of the Indian boarding schools across the country and across uh, the continent. And so uh, it's done with sensitivity, but also with great honesty as it tells the story of actually the author's grandmother, I believe, and her experience going to um, an Indian boarding school. Yeah. Do you have any more? Yeah, I do. I wanted to talk about Child of the Flower Song People, the story of Luz Jimenez. Um, this one is kind of like a mix in the sense that it's indigenous, but also set in Mexico. And it was just a really beautiful picture book about um, kind of like a biography of this person and how she kind of like set apart and went on her own way to kind of like bring light to her culture and her people. Um, and it's just very beautifully illustrated and it's, uh, I feel like a good representation of like, this is a text written about a person that I had never heard of. Um, and I was able to learn about the nuances of that background and that culture. Um, and our next theme is modern slash everyday life. And so we've kind of categorized these books as like, just kind of books that are set in modern day times, but are kind of like, just like going about their normal, you know, space in the sense of like, not every book necessarily has to have like, a teachable moment or a nod to history. It can just be like, these are people living their lives with facets of a culture or background that is just like their everyday moment. But for you, it might be more of a nuance or it might be a different experience because you know we all have different experiences in how we go about life. So um, I don't know, I'll, I'll kick things off with um, two picture books. One, I think that, no, actually we've both read these, but we, I forgot. Yeah. But what's my superpower? Um, we just read this pretty recently and it so was, cute. it was so cute. And it's just like a girl going about her life, you know, being like, what is my superpower? And the illustrations were like, so cute. So like modern, but timeless kind of feeling. Um, and it's just, you know, like her wondering, like seeing all of her friends and seeing like what they're doing that like is a superpower. Uh, I don't want to spoil the ending, you know, yes. but definitely check it out. Yeah, one of the things I loved about that one was uh, just even the inclusion of some um, inuk words uh, that, you know, she calls her mother um, and, the, and the mom calls her panik and like there's just different words that are thrown out and that so you get to still see part of the indigenous culture, which is, um, yeah. I had to look up actually where it was from because I'd never heard of the Inuk, I just had only heard of the Inuit and this is like supposed to be like very, very northern kind of Can Canadian territory, one that I didn't even realize people lived in type of situation, you know, and so that was, it also like forced me to like look up more information and learn more. Um, but it also was not about their culture. It was just about 
her as a kid, like yeah. living her life and exploring the world. I love that. Um, and then the other one is fry bread that you were talking about, right? <laughs> yeah, which I think like you pretty much will always get me if you have any book that is set about food yeah. or like brings into the picture and they're just like, this is a food that, you know, like we like eat together and celebrate and you're like giving, you know, a little bit more of the context, you know, and some of like the background of like fry bread. And I, I, I'm, please correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there a recipe? There is, he does. And he talks about how, so Kevin, the author talks about how fry bread is um, cooked in very, it's like different native uh, tribes make fry bread in different ways and have a slightly different recipe. They have different rules for it. This is the recipe that he learned from his grandmother and he's made some tweaks and played around with it with his own children. Um, and the illustrations actually also shows a lot of community and and how like fry bread mm -hmm. is about community and about kind of that passing along. Um, but also how in some ways it's a, you know, there oftentimes it, uh, is like maybe one central person in the family or in the tribe that is the fry bread maker and how that's changing because, you know, not everybody lives on a reservation or they don't necessarily live in the same type of communities they once did. So what does it like to still pass down that culture? Um, and so one of the things I love is how every page represents like fry bread means something about like what it means to be native to him and about, and like, and, um, and it kind of like shows how fry bread, this food is at the root of what it means. Um, but yes, there is a recipe. Uh, and I have actually not still tried fry bread in real life, but I drove through um, New Mexico and they have fry bread stands there. And the one I stopped at was closed, but I'm driving through again soon and I'm hoping it's open. And I really want to try some fry bread because this book basically makes you salivate at the mouth wanting some. Oh yeah, no, I've been to, a couple of powwows because I lived in Oklahoma for a little bit and we would eat fry bread and it was delicious. So, oh, so definitely good. jealous. Uh, one of the picture books I was reading that also I thought was everyday life was Birdsong by Julie Fleet. Um, and that one just is actually a girl and her mom who moved from the city to the country and how she befriends her uh, neighbor, her old elderly neighbor. And again, everyday life, it's not about being native and like, oh, let's like, you know, it's just about living my life. And it just happens that she is a native girl. And so there are times that certain words she uses, like at one point, the her neighbor's teaching her about the phases of the moon. And she's like, oh, that's like our what we name the moon and this is what we would call the wolf moon or the this moon and they get to kind of compare the way that they talk about nature together and it was just like a lovely story um and emotional story as well too as she and her elderly neighbor just kind of like grow in relationship and you know mm -hmm. the seasons change and so with the seasons their relationship changes as well did you yeah. have any non-picture books in this category i do i have um a middle grade anthology ancestor approved um, and one of these things that I thought was really interesting, it is, it's centered at a powwow, um, and it has a bunch of different authors who have written interconnecting interwoven stories that have like characters who jump from story to story and it's like all interconnected. Um, but it was cool to see like so many different perspectives and different aspects of like, you know, going to a powwow, being in a powwow, aftermaths of, um, going to it and then like having drama and see where like things come up so it, it was pretty cool to kind of like see all these people come together and have an interwoven story with all of these different threads um and then of course or maybe not of course if you haven't heard of it but firekeeper's daughter you know um is like set in modern day and it's a thriller it's kind of a mystery um, it's like a little bit of romance. It's very dramatic and it kept me on the edge of my seat and the cover is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. I want to pick it up because of how pretty it is, but I'm also slightly terrified of mysteries and thrillers. And so I've not picked it up for that reason, but yeah, the <laughs> cover definitely like draws you in every time. And I have most, I'm like, you know, you want to read this, don't you? And I'm like, but am I scared to read it? <laughs> I will say, even though it is like a mystery thriller at its heart and core, um, it is not too, too scary. And I think what I loved about it is that sh the author, Angeline, so seamlessly weaves in um, words from her, which I'm now blanking on her background. So I apologize, but they weave in words from her native language and the main character's native language. Um, and it's just, it feels very seamless and natural in the sense that you get to step inside part of their world and see like their heritage and their character or their culture. Um, and so I thought that was really nice because you kind of get like to see how they navigate the world as an indigenous person who has like different connections and different threads and different nuances of being like native this side, you know, versus like having this aspect of native. Um, so it's, it's good all around, not too, too scary. 
All right, I'll consider it then. Um, I am though in the middle of reading answers approved and I do love how like they're all heading to the exact same powwow um, and but you're getting different people's stories and experiences through them. And what I can tell from the anthology is it's featuring, um, I mean, obviously it features all native authors, but it has some who are kind of legacy authors who've been in the game maybe for a little while and but also some new voices who I'd never heard before. And so I'm excited to kind of just like even search for what else have this has this person written so I can hopefully expand my library and um, just my reading in general. Um, one YA that I do want to mention in this space as well too is called Turtle Under Ice. And uh, this one was surprising in a sense that like it's also about a native person who's not living within any sort of na their native context. I mean, besides their family, and uh, and so you got you you can also see kind of how does um, how does your native identity look like when you are the only native person kind of around you and is when it comes to your friends, when it comes to your school. Um, they're a little bit rural, uh, but. Um, part of it is that actually she's currently living with her dad and stepmother who kind of have hidden that part of their life and have pressed uh, like have in some way suppressed it but then she's remembering their mother um, and their mother who and the memories of that and so part of it is her exploring kind of her relationship with her mother and in doing so it means that she has to think back to her ancestral stories and what does it mean to like you know know your ancestors and know who you come from and it just kind of it's, it's it's very much a coming of age identity type story um and it really and i just thought it was really beautiful where um it's so relatable and that all of us probably go through that as humans where we're trying to figure out who am i and um and how does my ancestry how does my life impact my identity in that sense and so that exploration was just really deep and i believe it's a novel in verse so it was, i just remember listening on audio so my brain now is like forgetting what um it was but it was just so lyrically written and so i do mm -hmm. think it was in verse for that reason as well um but just a lovely read yeah um, and then i guess we probably should have done this after history and historical a little bit but like whatever we're doing things how we want to do things but our next theme is nonfiction, and so these ones are like the previously those ones are stories that are based within history or like uh, touch on historical stories, but this one actually is straight up nonfiction and um, uh, and has and is like straightforward. And there's a lot here that you can look at. Um, I definitely recently the She Persisted chapter book series has two, uh, mm -hmm. one by, one about Maria Tall Chief and then another one about Wilma Mankiller. Um, we have Sharice's Big Voice, which um, if you're aware, we had our first. Uh, native um congresswoman right um from oklahoma because like go on to the u.s congress if i'm saying that correctly because i'm not a very political person sorry my bad um and but this talks about her childhood and also the road it took her to get into office and just kind of what that looked like uh i really liked redbird sings which is the story of zitzkala sa uh because she was a native american um like violinist um or was it cellist oh my gosh why am i like forgetting the details of this woman but like she wrote classical music and like wrote a lot of beautiful like songs and music and did so many things within the arts that and i had never heard of her and i just thought it was like this is so cool and like she had played at the white house she had done this like she had like was this major musician uh, that had so much respect during her day and time and they like wrote some poetry but also include like a lot of her um her own letters and her own um just journal entries like as part of the basis for every bit of the story as uh, what we're getting and i thought it was really great um and the only other one i want to mention is uh not your princess uh voices of native american women and that's just kind of pushing back on the way that um you know if you think about your first introduction to uh, a native person being peter pan's um uh tiger lily and just like this trope of what it means to be an indian princess they kind of, this is like that pushing back of like no and so hashtag not your princess was a hashtag that was started um to kind of push back on the, like the stereotypes of what it means to be a native woman and uh this book kind of gathers a lot of the stories and um essays and different like art projects and things like that that kind of like speak out against it and say this is what it means to be a native woman and we are not your princess <laughs> yeah no, um, I had one nonfiction title, which is called Redbone, the true story of a Native American rock band. And what was interesting is about this it was an adult graphic novel oh, fun. biography of this band, which um, is very popular for one of their songs that was featured in the Marvel movie, which I'm now blanking on the title, but you know, it's like, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> so, oh, you mean uh, the, uh, the one that um, home dude, uh, Chris Pratt. <laughs> Place with yeah. Guardians of the Galaxy. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes, um, they played that. They were a native band. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's like, those iconic. like I feel like everybody knows that song. I don't even know songs from the, that era very much because I was just born, but like I still know that yeah. song. <laughs> yeah. So the graphic novel kind of talks about how they kind of initially, I think, um, were more hesitant about being very upfront with them being a native band. Mm. But then at the end of the day, they were like, no this is who we are and they fully embraced it and it was kind of cool to see like their journey in a graphic novel format um and like their ebbs and flows of the band and so that also kind of segues into our really short next category which is folklore and the way it segues is that my first one is also another graphic novel um but it's called trickster native american tales and it's kind of like looking at a lot of the folklore behind you know like the trickster character and how like that shows up in native folklore and it's like this really thick anthology of a bunch of different artists and authors and writers um talking about like short snippets of trickster aspects um and it was it was pretty interesting and it was also graphic novel format so you got like a lot of different styles and formats and interpretations you know and it was very interesting and then I will admit that this is a little bit of a cheat, but maybe not too much, but I am in the middle, mostly almost done of reading A Snake Falls to Earth by Darcy Little Badger. And I am very intrigued um, by what is happening in the story. And it definitely has like two different worlds and it's kind of like set in the sense of like these animal people who are able to embody like a human form, but also their, their normal fine form. I'm not explaining this very well, but they're the form that they're most likely will be in is an animal form, but they can take on a human form. Okay, so like shapeshifters kind of? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, like, but they live in a different world than earth, but their like um, animal forms are tied to the animals in our present day. And like, kind of like looking on the nuances, I haven't finished it yet, um, but it won some awards at ALA earlier this year. Um, and I'm very intrigued to see how it ends, but, I liked that it was that aspect of like kind of looking at folklore, but then kind of like talking about the nuances of like that kind of background and, you know, like what it would be like if some of these folklores came to life in our like everyday presence. So those were two short ones, but I think you had some books under the theme of family. Yeah. So one thing that is very true about native culture, from what I can tell from what I've read, because obviously I'm not native, is that family is really important. And that being able to communicate uh, in the same way that like the love and connection for the earth, I feel like it even is even more so when it comes to community, when it comes to the family. And so um, I just, there's a, quite a few books that are written by native people that uh, we're just, you know, expressing kind of that love of the family unit. And uh, so Monique Gray Smith um, has two books that one is called My Heart Fills with Happiness. The other one is called We Are Kind. And it just kind of explores how, you know, life is and like being with family and friends makes you happy or like how how their family represents kindness um and what i love about it is that there are versions actually and that if you most versions that you find actually are bilingual and so they have plains cree um as well on the page and so you can read it in both english and plains cree um and i just thought that was really fun and really cool and then um we sang you home by richard van camp like this is another one that is going to be like an auto buy for baby shower gifts it's just like talking about how um you know babies were cho like chose us to be their parents and to be the people to guide them and, and this idea of like we sang you to come home and you sang back to us and it's just very beautifully poetic and just such a lovely lovely read and what I loved about both is again like they're not necessarily like saying hey let's talk about a specific native culture or even focus on that but like here's just these words that all of us can relate to but like the images are clearly showing off their uh life and their community and um and that's something that is connected and then it's just coming from that point of view you can tell because of the authors and who they are um so did want to mention those two because they're just so lovely um as well our last name is non-american voices and we just want to highlight some a few um authors who are not from either us or canada even that's where most of the authors came from and so one that came to mind for me is from the maori culture in new zealand whale rider by witi ihimera and it's kind of talks about the whale rider being kind of like the father of the maori people and but also contrasts to a modern day story where the maori culture is kind of dying out and this grandfather is looking for the next 
chief to take over and make sure they don't die. Um, and the only person who seems to be interested is his granddaughter, but women cannot be chiefs, what? And so it's just like the conflict that um, of them as the, you know, watching the culture die. And uh, there's parallels of like uh, mythology and the whale and actual whales also sort of like struggling and, you know, potentially also being lost and dying and just kind of how that happens. And so there's a little bit of the suspense of like, will they be saved or will this be the end of their people? And that's something that gets explored in that book. And then another one is uh, Dreamtime, uh, which is Aboriginal stories from Australia um, by Uduguru. And um, she is an author who is from Aust an Aboriginal culture in um, Australia and basically writes her childhood out in these poetic like stories, as well as also tells some Indigenous folklore as well through it. Um, and so you get um, yeah, some of her personal life growing up as an Aboriginal, but then also what are some of the bigger stories that Aboriginal people have passed down from generation to generation as well in uh, this anthology of like, I guess, collection of stories that she has written. Um, and I thought both of those were quite lovely. Yeah, no. And I think that like, we're always on the hunt to read more stories that are not necessarily centered in our viewpoint. Um, and one of the ones I wanted to highlight was Zonia's Rainforest. Um, which I hopefully said the main character's name right, but if not, he here we go. Um, but it's set in the Amazon rainforest and it's very lush. It's very much like, this is a girl, this is her home. This is like where she lives. This is what she wants to do to protect it. And the illustrations are low-key gorgeous, not even low-key, high-key gorgeous. <laughs> um, but I think it just like does a really good job of setting you in her actual backyard her actual space where she lives and kind of you give giving you the perspective of like this is her home these are like the ways that like how we treat the earth kind of can impact the entire ecosystem um and you know at times it felt a little bit dire but I also think that because it was in a picture book format it was also done in such a nice way to be like showing you someone's perspective but also gently kind of saying check yourself before you wreck yourself. Like, what are you doing, you know, to the world that is our home? So those, those are our books. And, you know, we're also now going to go into our NSK highlight. So, you know, each episode we highlight one NSK Newstat finalist and the NSK is a Newstat prize for children's literature and has been awarded every other year to a living writer or author illustrator. And this month, of course, we're going to highlight our 2021 winner, Cynthia Lytick Smith, um, who is an Indigenous writer. And Boomi, I don't know if you want to give a little bit about her background. Yeah. So, I mean, Cynthia has been in the game for quite a while. Um, and, you know, what, when we were listing all the names earlier, all the books earlier, you know, there's lots of authors and Native authors that have been around trying to put the Native voice out there. Um, mm -hmm. There's Tim Tingle, there's Monique Gray Smith, there's Tracy Sorrell. Like, I mean, it goes on and on. And there are definitely people who have been in the game. And she's one of those people as well, too, who's been trying to really bring out um, the Native voice. And um, in general, she just has been a leader in this space. Um, especially uh, more recently. Um, and so she's a New York Times bestselling author. Um, she's won um, some library association awards, right? Um, she is the editor of Ancestors Approved, that uh, anthology that we both talked about where she's the one who brought together all those um, writers together in order to create that, um, you know, just on and on and on. And um, she, you know, lives in Austin, Texas. She's part of the Muscogee Nation. And uh, she also is actually on the faculty of the MFA, a low residency program at the Vermont um, College of Fine Arts, which is a really popular one. Most, a lot of major children's book authors go through that program. So it's kind of cool that they are learning from uh, her. And, you know, writing about Native people has just been really important to her own work. And it's not all that she's ever done. She's also written in other places, but it's how she started as a debut. And it's definitely where she has focused most of her career now. She actually is um, the author and curator of Heart Drum, which is an imprint with a Harper College Children's Book that only does Native uh, focused mm -hmm. books. And so at the moment, most of the books they've released have been written by her, but then she's also the curator who has brought in um, some of these newer and legacy voices in order to share their stories as well. And so, yeah, um, we're excited that she um, won this year. It's nice to um, 
be able to do that. And you are able to like go onto the WLT website and check out her speech and check out the award ceremony. Mm -hmm. um, it is all on there. Just look for the 2021 and SK prize lecture and you can hear her speak more about her work that way. Yeah, um, we did read some of her work. So we were going to talk about that too. Um, and I actually read her debut, um, which is a picture book called Jingle Dancer. I read this years ago. Uh, and I remember thinking it was just so lovely and so gorgeous and uh, didn't even think about the author's name or make a connection until uh, much later. And, uh, you know, it's about a young girl who is um, like putting together her powwow regalia in order to, um, you know, get ready for her first jingle dance and mm -hmm. that shows how the women of every generation her family her grandmother her aunt her mother her you know on and on like all come together to help her put it together and uh, for her to be able to dance to honor them but also she chose to kind of apparently like structure the story around the number four which is an important number in the Muskogee culture so everything in the book happens in like groups of fours the number of mm -hmm. jingles on her dress or the rose jingle dress, the number of directions of the number of this like you know um she uses four as a central number throughout and the last thing I loved about this book, it also features a Black and Native character. So her aunt um, is a mixed race. And there are definitely a lot of Black Native people um, and people who are both Black and Native. And I feel like those, that's a narrative that is maybe not as publicly known or spoken about. And so she had said that she had wanted to make sure to incorporate that for that reason, because she wanted to make sure that as much as possible, she was showing um, a diverse a Native experience as best as she could. And even as she was focusing on her own nation and her own, like, you know, everything else. So yeah. That's yeah. Kind of okay. No, and I recently read Hearts Unbroken by Cynthia Lytik Smith. And this is a YA novel and it's very interesting in the sense that it's, you know, a, at the very beginning of the premise of the story is like a teenage girl in high school, you know, who's dating this guy and he made some kind of off color remarks about native folk. And she was like, I'm not about that dumps him you know but to be fair kind of has like a negative background of like how do I as a teenage girl a go to high school which is already fraught with like all sorts of obnoxious things you know I but rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but like also dealing with like your cultural background and you know kind of figuring out where you fit in there navigating the two different worlds but then you know like kind of also maybe developing feelings for another guy but he's also spoiler not native as well and so it's kind of like does she go along that path because she had a bad experience and I think that this book did a really good job of bringing up some very you know like heavy issues or like thought-provoking aspects of like what do you do when people are saying things that are not nice or off base or in some senses maybe they're just flat out ignorance or maybe they're doing it to be offensive but like how do you navigate that like while staying true to yourself um I just thought overall I was so well done um I think everyone should read it but you know I think it's just really powerful when you have someone who is bringing their culture to life but doing it in a way that is like so natural because like it's, it's their experiences and then you get to read their work and step into their shoes and feel what it's like to navigate a world from their viewpoint with their you know backgrounds and like see kind of like how their mind ticks and like what nuances that they are thinking about. Um, so very appreciative of all the books on this list, you know, and of course we'll have all the books listed in the link below. Um, and you know, if you have other books that you're like, oh, this is a really great indigenous author, writer, illustrator that you should check out 1000%, tell us, we wanna know, we wanna read more. Um, but you can also check out um, more books and more authors and writers at WT at worldliteraturetoday.org. And Boomi, I think we're gonna take it away. We're gonna slightly shift stuff up with a quote. Yeah, so instead of doing our normal quotes, we're going to actually quote from Cynthia's NSK uh, Prize Award uh, lecture. Um, there's a lot of deep things she said. I think the biggest thing that we want to say with this um, episode um, is just that like Native people, they're still here, they still matter, their stories still matter. And I know a lot of times we sometimes, uh, our culture does not act that way. And there has been a hist history of trying to erase and destroy and oppress, but I love that their stories are continuing to shine through and ultimately uh, teach us about them, but also teach us 
um, more about ourselves because we can learn a lot from them. And so from Cynthia, um, she says, here's to more exclusive, engaging, and respectful reimagining of children's and teen literature, wherein any young character can be a hero that everyone shares. We find diverse representation defined broadly in the bylines and the structures and worldviews that frame the stories themselves. There's still much work to be done, but it's fair to say that if we can decolonize Neverland, we can do anything. See you next time. Bye. Happy reading. Mm -hmm.